Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Any of the people that uh, can fill in here as, as we go along. As I, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be an archive show, so uh, you're going to be able to come back to the website tomorrow and get a version that you can download to your computer of this whole lecture experience and watch offline at, at your own leisure. Okay, so today's topic, so I'm going to be covering uh, the ancient astronauts having to do with the Sumerian connection. Uh, Sumer, basically, is uh, where, we mod where we would call today's modern-day Iraq. Now, Sumer has been mentioned throughout history as Mesopotamia, Babylon, the cradle of civilization, but the first culture that we have record of, literally, in the history of, of <clears throat> as we understand it now, points 6,000 years ago to ancient Iraq's Sumer. So tonight we're just going to go through some of the artifacts and things that point out that there was a time when man actually lived amongst his living gods. Just like the Bible says there were giants upon the earth, the Sumerians very specifically speak of a time when they lived amongst these beings. And it's not just a translated English version of the story, it's coming from the source. Okay, so a couple of things just to uh, dive into the topic of, you know, where do we come from? It's kind of a, a thing that modern science has been trying to answer through either a Darwinistic uh, perspective or through evolution. Uh, was, it, was it God creating the earth in seven days or have we been naturally evolving from something ever so simplistic to something more complex? One of the theories that has recently made uh, light in the scientific realms is panspermia, the idea that life arrives whole and complete, that somehow asteroids hitting the earth or some initial collision that we might have had with a large body in our own solar system billions of years in the past could have actually brought life to our planet whole and complete. Science can't explain how all of a sudden, <clears throat> excuse me, there was this large burst all of a sudden of life, meaning it's kind of like there were these amino acids floating around and a bolt of lightning struck them and all of a sudden, life. It's just not that possible. I mean, for a system to have life, we're talking about something to be able to take in nutrients, process them, and expel them. It's not just an easy thing that would whim together. And so one of the ideas to answer this confusion about how life could have started is maybe that it, arro it arrived to Earth whole and complete. So another interesting uh, analogy of looking for signs of life in places where we might not expect it is Europa. And this ties into you know, things we see here on Earth because we have in the deepest parts of the oceans, you can break down... Uh, or excuse me, you can go down 25, 30 miles deep into the ocean and we find these thermal vents shown here of this little thing breaking through the ice and shining its light on the vent. They can actually break through the surface on Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter in our own solar system that very clearly has up to a 40 mile deep ocean under its surface. Now, Europa is covered with ice, so it's, it's a big icy planet. You can see it up here on the right. And underneath that surface, if we were to send a probe and crack through the ice, we might actually find signs of life. Other moons of Jupiter, Ganymede, Callisto, are highly volcanic activity, very hot. So on this other moon, Europa, is filled with water. So we combine heat, water, we might have the elements that are needed for life. Not always required to have sunlight, just as we've shown here on Earth. We go down to these thermal vents where there's no light whatsoever, and these vents are uh, you know, expelling sulfur and other various minerals, and we find crabs and all types of uh, insects and things that are feeding off this. It's very interesting. So it really starts to raise the question, uh, you know, how, how did man get to where he is? If we haven't evolved, which a lot of people would say, you know, the reason why there's, there's, there's this missing link is what it's called in the Darwinistic evolution, is they haven't been able to find anything that connects us from the Neanderthal man to us. So they say, oh, well, there's a missing link, and we're going to eventually find something that connects us to the pre-hominoid Neanderthal man. Haven't found it yet. So how did we get here? How, how, how is it that we show up on Earth? And interestingly enough, when we analyze many of the structures around the world from our ancient cultures, they show a type of brilliance and a knowledge being displayed that, frankly, modern archaeologists don't attribute to ancient man. So they would say things like, oh, well, Stonehenge and the Giza pyramids or Nazca, these megalithic monuments here in Baalbek and Lebanon, uh, 
we don't have the technology even today to cut rocks out of the ground that are this large and carry them five miles away and perfectly stack them. If you look closely enough here on the image on the right, you can actually see a gentleman who's standing next to the wall and, and to give you an idea of just how large these stones are. So these are called Trilithaton stones. This is in Baalbek in Lebanon. And it's just another one of the sacred sites around the world that clearly ancient man possessed the knowledge or the technical know-how to be doing things that we didn't quite attribute them having. Mathematics, science, geometry, uh, things having to do with astronomy and alignment of the stars, which specifically I focused on the Sumerian connection and we're going we're gonna to look into tonight. So the Sumerians basically show up, as I, as I said, yeah, 6,000 BC, which is around, uh, excuse me, that's actually incorrect. It's 4,000 BC and it's 6,000 years ago. So we're, we're talking about a culture that's around 6,000 years old. And they show up uh, right between the Tigris and Euphrates. You can look there on the map. It's labeled Mesopotamia. Excuse me. And that's basically our modern day Iraq. And that fertile strip of land has been called the cradle of civilization, where our where our our first culture showed up. Now we've had cavemen and, and you know hunter gatherer groups that have left traces of their evidence, but the Sumerian culture was the first one to leave us a complete record of a civilization, a writing, mathematics, science, agriculture, all of these things. Over 100 of the firsts needed to have a high civilization came from Sumer and we still use many of these today. One of the interesting things they left, up, left us is mathematics. Now they had a system of mathematics called sexagesimal, which was based on six and ten, sixty for, for easiest uh, reference. And what they were able to do was to divide and, and show in geometry very high uh, numbers of area and distribution and very small numbers. So they were able to do very accurate measurements based on their mathematical system. And literally, this is a culture coming right out of the Stone Age that just appears in, in, uh, in southern Iraq in uh, you know, 4000 BC. So some of the items that they left us, again, having to do with the time, 12 hours in a day, 12 inches in a foot, 60 minutes in an, in, in an hour, 60 seconds in a minute, uh, 12 months in a year, all of this comes from the Sumerian information of, of what we still use today. Now, interestingly enough, there is a scholar named Zachariah Sitchin. Hopefully some of you would be familiar with him. Uh, he's written a series of books called The Earth Chronicles, some of them shown here. And he has done over 50 years now of research in translating the Sumerian texts and putting it into a very large-scale understanding of what was taking place in our past. So Zachariah Sitchin is one of about 270 people in the whole world that can actually read this ancient language called cuneiform script. The Sumerians had the first written language and it was called cuneiform script. It consisted of over 400 characters. They used something called a stylus, was kind of like an oversized screwdriver, and they would twist it and turn it in the clay or sometimes uh, in inscribing it on precious stone as you see here, leaving a written language called cuneiform script. Now along with the text, they also provided many pictograms and cylinder seals which would accompany the text as a visual guide to describe what you were seeing. And, you know, as a, a, the old saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, so they learned that very quickly. This is actually a very interesting stellar that shows uh, the 12 houses of the zodiac. Now again, there's that number 12, which we're, we're going to discuss quite thoroughly uh, in the lecture. Uh, tonight, but here they're showing, and if you look, you can actually see the the lion and the scorpion, and these are and these are basically there's a snake going around the top side of it. These are symbols from our zodiac inscribed on.